If you haven't done so yet, make sure you pause the video and attempt to solve this question on your own first before listening on. In order to find the tension T1, what we're going to do is examine this junction right here where three strings come together and we're going to draw the forces that are acting at that junction. And we can do that over here. Now we can see that one of the forces acting at the junction is the tension T1, which would be pointing upward and to the left. So we can come over here and draw a force pointing up and to the left, and we'll label it T1. We also have T2, which is going to be pulling on this junction to the right. And so we can label that force as well. And then finally, we have this downward force that's being exerted by the weight of block A. And so we can label a downward force and mark it perhaps WA. We'll notice that WA points exactly along the y-axis and T2 points exactly along the x-axis, but T1 is pointing in both directions. And for any forces that are pointing in both directions, both the x and the y, what you want to do is break them into their x and y components. But before we do that, let's make sure that we label the angle with the Greek letter phi that's shown in the diagram. So we would have that angle right here and we can label it as such. Now what we'll do is draw in the y and x components. We would see that we have a component for T1 that's pointing straight up, and we'll color it in a lighter pinkish color. And then we have an x component that's pointing straight across to the left. Now we'll notice that the y component that's pointing up is adjacent to the angle that's marked phi. And because it's adjacent, we're going to be using the cosine function to represent it. So here we could say T1 times the cosine of that angle. And then we have the X component, which is pointing to the left and is opposite to that angle. Because it's opposite, we'll use the sine function. So we would label this component T1 times the sine of the angle. And also because it's pointing to the left, we'll make sure that we mark it as being a negative force. Now that we have the Y and X components, we can actually go into the drawing and erase T1, because when we analyze forces, we only want to be considering their Y and X components. Now, after breaking the forces into the components, we can apply Newton's second law. And perhaps we can apply that law first in the Y direction. Newton's second law tells us that the sum of the forces that are acting in the Y direction would equal the mass of this object here, the junction of those ropes, times the acceleration. Now, we know that the junction of those three ropes isn't accelerating. It's not falling downward, it's not moving upward, in fact it's at rest entirely, and so the acceleration would actually be zero. If we plug zero in for the acceleration, then mass times zero, of course, will still be zero. So the right-hand side becomes zero, and this is a situation that is known as equilibrium when the sum of the forces is equal to zero. Now, remember, we're looking at the y direction, and if you go back to the diagram and look for forces that are acting in the y direction, you would see that you have the T1 cos of that angle, phi. And because it's pointing upward, it would actually have a positive value. And then another force that's acting in the y direction is WA, and it's pointing downward. So you have to make sure that you say minus that WA. Now remember, in part A, we're trying to solve for T1. So what we can do is actually add WA over to the right-hand side. And then we can divide both sides of this equation by the cosine of the angle. And once we have this expression for T1, we can plug in the known values. The weight of block A was given as 40 newtons, and then the angle phi was given as 35 degrees. So let's plug those values in. And when you compute that, you should get approximately 49 newtons. And so this will be the value of T1 and the correct answer to part A. Now we can return to the same free body diagram and apply Newton's second law, but this time in the x direction. And so we would say that the sum of the forces acting in the x direction is equal to mass times acceleration in the x direction. Remember that the junction of those three strings is not accelerating. So the value for A would be zero, making the entire right-hand side zero once again. The sum of the forces in the x direction would include positive T2, and then this minus T1 sine of phi. In part B, we're looking to solve for T2, so let's go ahead and add T1 sine phi over to the other side. 
and conveniently we can actually plug in the value of t1 that we just found in part a, which again was roughly 49 newtons, and then multiply by the sine of phi, which was 35 degrees. And when we do this, we get a value of approximately 28 newtons for T2. And so this is the correct answer to part B. To solve the rest of the question, we're going to examine the forces that are acting at this junction of three ropes. So we'll come over here and draw a similar looking free body diagram. We have T3 pointing up and to the right. We have the weight of block B pulling straight down on that junction. So we can label that WB. And then we have tension T2 pulling to the left on that junction. Now T2 and WB are pointing on either the X or Y axis. It's T3 that we're going to have to break into components. And just like before, let's first draw in the angle here. Now notice they're using the Greek letter theta this time. And we want to draw in the components of T3. So we're going to have a component that points straight up and then a, po a component that points straight to the right. This component is adjacent to the angle, so we're going to use the cosine. We're going to have T3 times the cosine of theta. And then this component is opposite to the angle, so we're going to have T3 times the sine of the angle. And once again, let's remove the resultant force T3 because we only want to be dealing with the y and x components. Next, we would like to once again note that the sum of the forces in the x direction is going to equal 0 and the sum of the forces in the y direction will also equal zero because that junction of three strings is again in equilibrium. And because of the sum of the forces in both directions equals zero, what that means is that the force that we have marked WB, which is pointing straight downward, must have the same value as the force that we have marked T3 cosine of theta, which is pointing upward. They must be equal but opposite in direction because the sum of the forces again is zero. Now we were told that WB was equal to 50 newtons. That means that T3 cosine of theta is also equal to 50 newtons. And the same argument will apply with the horizontal or X direction forces. We know that the force that's pointing to the left must be equal in magnitude to the force that's pointing to the right. We know that T2 was 28 newtons. We had figured that out earlier. That means that this force right here, that's pointing opposite, must also equal 28 newtons. And the reason that's advantageous is because you can see with the 50 newton force and the 28 newton force, which were the components of T3, we could actually find the magnitude of T3. Let's put T3 back into the picture. And we can see that we have formed a nice right triangle. We know this side is 50 newtons and this side is 28 newtons, so we can use the Pythagorean theorem to get the magnitude of T3. So let's go ahead and do so. We would say that T3 squared is equal to 50 squared plus 28 squared. To solve for T3, we would take the square root on both sides of the equation. And when we solve that out, we would get approximately 57 newtons. So this is the correct answer to part C. And then finally, we can find the angle theta using either this equation right here, that T3 cos theta equaled 50, or T3 sine theta equaled 28. We'll choose the first equation, and so we can come over here and say 50 newtons is equal to T3, which was 57 newtons, times the cosine of that angle. We'll divide both sides by 57. And then to solve for theta, we would have to do the inverse cosine of this fraction here. And when we punch that in, we're going to get about 29 degrees for theta. And so that becomes the correct answer to part D.